Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice together and be glad in it as we come together and worship to receive God's gift through His Word uh, this morning. So welcome to any guests and visitors. Welcome to those joining us online and God's blessings as you hear His Word this morning. Uh, because God's Word brings us all together, whether we hear it here in person or online or over the radio or wherever we're hearing it, whether we're reading it together with other people, God's Word brings us good gifts. And so uh, we join together in worship this morning, and it's good that we are together to hear that. Uh, don't have any other announcements for um, <clears throat> the service, uh, other than when we get to the hymn of praise, just remain standing for uh, the hymn of praise praise. Uh, so with that, let us join together in singing our opening hymn, Amazing Grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Teach us to number our days, that we may get a heart of wisdom. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. And every one of your just and righteous decrees endures forever. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. So it is in light of that name that we make our confession together. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of silence and reflect on God's word in our own lives. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our full heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word proclaim the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us join together in singing our hymn of praise. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the strength of all who trust in you, and without your aid we can do no good thing. Grant us the help of your grace, that we may please you in both will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. <clears throat> Our Old Testament reading for today comes from Amos chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, where God's people are warned by the prophet Amos. Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. Go to Kalna and look at it. Go from there to great Hamath. And then go down to Gath in Philistia. Are they better off than your two kingdoms? Is your land larger than theirs? You put off the evil day and bring near a reign of terror. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fatted calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on your musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
People who want to get rich fall into temptation and are trapped and are trapped and into foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandering, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and you made your good confession unto the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pilate, made a good confession, I charge you to keep this command without doubt or blame. Appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God is <coughs> blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, and who lives in an unapproachable light which no one can have seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this presence. <coughs> Present world to be arrogant, not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, we lay up treasures for ourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may. Take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand as you're able as we sing, as we uh, sing the Alleluia in verse together. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, 
They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. At this time, you may be seated, and the children are welcome to come forward for a children's message. Hey, guys, yeah, you can just take a seat right around here. We'll make a little semicircle, and we'll talk here together, which will be great fun. It is good to see you guys this morning. How many of you are awake? Alert and enthusiastic. Yeah, all of you should raise your hands that you're awake. Yeah, I don't see. <laughs> I'm not awake. Yeah. Uh, hey, so I, I need you guys to repeat something with me. It's going to be our little memory verse this morning. Can you guys repeat things? Are you guys good at repeating things? No. Okay. Well, we're going to do it anyways. <laughs> okay. So here's what we're going to repeat. The phrase is "Godliness with contentment is great gain." So. Repeat after me. Godliness Godliness with contentment contentment is great gain. gain. Let's try it one more time. Godliness Godliness with contentment contentment is is great gain. Yeah, there's lots of big words in that verse. It comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, and it's verse 6. So you guys are already doing memory work, which is awesome, but there's lots of big words in there that sometimes are hard to understand. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of those words today. Raise your hand if you love getting Christmas gifts. Yeah, yeah. Not really. Not really. Oh, you're having a rough morning, buddy. Man. What's your favorite thing to eat? I don't know. Yeah, sometimes I don't know either. But you love getting Christmas gifts. Everyone loves getting gifts. And sometimes, uh, have you ever wanted more than what you got at Christmas? You don't have to raise your hand, but think about that. Have you ever gotten more, or have you ever wanted more than what you got at Christmas time? Raise your hand if you have a toy from Christmas or from your birthday that you don't play with anymore. Yeah, sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens to us, and uh, we get things that we don't play with. What's that? Oh, that's nice. That's good. It's, you could say it's a gift that keeps on giving, right? Yeah, that's a good thing to give those gifts away because sometimes we get so many things in our lives that we think we're happy if we get more or the better thing or the best thing. You know what? <clears throat> Raise your hand if you love sweets and candy. Yeah, I do too. I do too. So I want to give you something. Everly, do you know what these are? Do you know what these are? What are they? Sucker? Yeah, it's a sucker. So I'm going to give you each a sucker here in just a little bit. I'm going to give you a sucker here in just a little bit. If you go to mom, that would be great. I'm going to give you a sucker here in a little bit, but I want you to think about this. If you had a thousand suckers all to yourself and you had to eat them in one day, if you had to eat them all in one day, raise your hand if you probably wouldn't like suckers for a while. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of like the idea of contentment. Remember our memory work verse, our Bible verse that we read? Let's repeat it again. Say, contentment, contentment with, godliness with godliness is great gain. Is great gain. Is great gain. So if you had a thousand suckers and they're so sweet, you might not want suckers for a little while. See, that's the opposite of contentment. Yeah, for maybe a long while. But you know what? If you got one sucker every other day, would you keep wanting a sucker? Yeah, probably, because it would be just enough. You know what? That would rot your teeth, which wouldn't be good. (laughs) But one of the good things is that Jesus' love for us 
is sweet. So when you get these suckers, I want you to think about how Jesus' love is sweet for us, and it is constantly there. It makes our lives good and healthy. It's not like candy that rots our teeth. Sorry, parents, for <laughs> giving your kids candy at 9.30 in the morning. But I want you guys to think about how when you taste this sucker, Jesus' love is sweet, it tastes good, it makes our lives better because he gives us forgiveness in each of our lives. So why don't we pray and then we'll, we'll have a gift and we'll be content with what God gives us. So let's pray. Repeat after me. And if you're a big person in the pew, you can pray too. Let's pray. Say, Dear Jesus, Jesus, thank you you. for loving us, for giving us us all things. things. Help us us. to be content content. by godliness godliness. through you you. so that that we can love others. others. In Jesus' name we pray. pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming up this morning, and you can have a sucker. And If you want it, you don't have to, um, but you can have a sucker and take it back to your pew. And we will join together in singing our hymn of the day, When Peace Like a River. Do you like repeat? <laughs>
Mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I've got a little trivia for us this morning. This TV show has 42 seasons. It amassed a huge 622 episodes. It gave rise to shows that are super popular on National Geographic, uh, History Channel, all sorts of different channels like uh, Man vs. Wild. Uh, it, it, it causes us to have little shorts that are uh, awesome on uh, Facebook feeds or uh, YouTube or Instagram or TikTok where we see people building oasises in the jungle or in the desert. And we love them because they're, they're surviving out in the wilderness. Does anyone know what this show might be? 42 episodes. Survivor. Survivor. Yeah, good, good. That's the show. CBS's Survivor's. 42 seasons, 622 episodes of people dueling it out in a competition for survival. It's pretty amazing, though, that despite all the entertainment, all the drama that goes into a TV show to keep us entertained in reality TV, right, that lots of people who go on that show end up having a deep appreciation for <laughs> surviving for living off little, very little. They end up spending time in the outdoors, like many of you have, where you find an appreciation for living off of the land. Maybe you grew up with very little in your own home, and you understand the value of a penny or a dollar and how to repair things and keep them going. You salvage and worked through times of survival. You know the routine, right? When you're out in the wilderness trying to survive, you get the necessities, food, water, and shelter. You use those things and get those first and foremost. When you're in a position of survival, you can't worry about, am I being the best version of myself? You can't worry about, is this really what I should be doing with my life? You can't ask questions like that because you're simply trying to survive. But it's ironic on the TV show Survivor that people gain this appreciation for living off the land, very little things trying to survive with the basic necessities. And then at the end of the competition, if you win it all, you get not only a car, but a cash prize of a million dollars. <laughs> Which one of us wouldn't raise our hands and say, yeah, that would be nice to have. Probably change my life a little bit, <laughs> if we're being modest. <laughs> but there's something that's always higher pushing us to reach new heights in our life. And you can see that in the TV show as people take advantage of one another, they use one another to try and make it to the end and be the lone survivor. See, we don't just want to survive. We actually want to thrive. We want to be pushed to thrive, to show everyone that we have reached the top and the greatest. And St. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 about people who have such a mindset in regards to money. He says, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And then he goes on to talk about one of the most quoted verses in the New Testament about money. You probably have heard it, where he writes, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. One of the struggles that Timothy as a pastor was facing as he pastored the congregation in Ephesus, you remember the book of Ephesians, right? In, in the New Testament, that's the people that Timothy, who St. Paul is writing to here in our epistle reading, is pastor of. And one of the challenges that, is, that are facing him and the people is that the people are fairly well off. 
They lived better lives than most of their peers. They had financial lives that were fairly well off. But those lives were so tempting, St. Paul says, that he knows of friends within that congregation that it caused them to wander away from the faith altogether. And we may think about the phrase, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and we say, well, see, money is the problem. The issue is, if they didn't worry about any money ever in their lives, they wouldn't have had that problem, and they wouldn't have fallen away from the faith. (laughs) But St. Paul says, the love of money is a root of all kinds of of evil. See, his point here is that he uses a metaphor to teach us that, it's, that money and wealth are not inherently evil or wrong or bad. What he wants us to see is that we've shifted from a mentality of survival, of just finding the bare necessities, and he transitions us to looking at life from a perspective of desire and passion, things that we love. And we all can relate to that, for we all have lots of different passions and desires. You can hear about it, like people saying, well, what what are you passionate about? What do you want to do with your life? See, there's nothing inherently wrong about that, but it's what that passion and desire are connected to. What are they grounded in? Some people ground their passions and desires into wealth. And here St. Paul wants to address that one desire, that one root, people who want to get rich. He warns us that if the desire for our life and the goal for our life is to amass wealth and riches, you will find yourself growing a root that sprouts and grows downward into all sorts of areas that are extremely dangerous for you. God's goal, though, is not to have us ignore wealth, to be careless with our money, to just live day by day and just go about giving it to anyone who asks. No, God wants us to have an appropriate relationship with wealth. He doesn't want us to hate our income, to stop working, to provide for those around us. Rather, he wants to provide us with everything. When you desire to be rich, when you want to be wealthy, to flaunt it in front of other people, whether they be poorer than you, whether they be richer than you, or whether they have the same stuff as you, it can cause you to go and put your roots towards all sorts of different things that can cause hurt, like getting the nicest boat, like getting a newer car because this one's, well, five years old and I don't really like it anymore and there's some stains that I don't really want to try and get out of this one, or maybe to update the house and have the latest nice fashion in your house and the trends in your house. Or maybe it's making sure that all the stocks and IRAs and accounts are all in the right order and you know that they're going to give you the best yields because you want to retire a little earlier. When we use our wealth to flaunt it in front of other people, whether they be higher or lower or the same as us, we only end up inflicting wounds on our body, on our mind, and even on our soul. The very first verse of our reading is verse 6, where St. Paul says to us, But godliness with contentment is great gain. That was the verse the kids learned earlier, if you didn't catch that. 
But godliness with contentment is great gain. St. Paul is saying that living a life that is truly at peace, a life that is truly filled with joy and contentment, means it is always connected to godliness. Because you can meet lots of different people who would say that, guess what? Money can buy you love. (laughs) It can buy you all sorts of things that love you back and you love in return. And you can have a very contented life. It can buy you friends. It can buy you people in high places. And you can be pretty content with some of those things. But St. Paul says all of that can go away so quickly. And we know this from history, but we really truly haven't learned our lesson. St. Paul wants to ground our lives in something deeper Godliness with contentment is great gain. What I mean by that is the source of contentment is always connected through roots to the richness found in Jesus. Enjoyment in our lives as we go throughout the many things that we have in our lives to enjoy, whether it be family, friends, good wine, good food, the environment, good nature, good neighbors, good schools. Those things we can truly begin to enjoy and cherish only if we are connected to godliness. That contentment comes when God shows us where our roots are. And those roots grow when we hear his word. Maybe you started to notice now, someone said earlier uh, before service, it's starting to look like fall out there. (laughs) And you could look right now out the windows. I don't know about this side. I didn't look that far back. But if you look out this window for sure, you can see the trees and the leaves. Maybe you started to notice that some of the colors are changing. It's beautiful to see the richness and the beauty that comes through a tree, throughout the seasons. Every single season that a tree goes through, whether it be fall, winter, or spring, or summer, every season has a beauty and a richness about that tree. I mean, think about from springtime, when you come out of this decay in winter when everything is gray and dusty and dirty, And that snow begins to melt away. And that tree begins to sprout up. And the leaves begin to come out. They look a little yellowish. And then start to become more green as the rains come down and water the earth. And its roots start to soak up all the nutrients that were stored up over winter for it. And then in summer it becomes into full bloom and it brings people into its shade that need relief from the heat it gives animals a home in the midst of of shelter in storms there's beauty for it above that you can see and even as it transitions to fall like it is now There is a richness and a uniqueness about a tree's richness that you can see that is evident for all people. It's not just in the colors. Because that tree begins to shrink away from thriving and it begins to see what is necessary as it moves towards a mode of survival in the winter. It's still in a mode of survival. The tree has great richness for all people to see. It's graced its bare limbs. Things that look like they could provide nothing for anyone, they're graced with great snowfalls. Even icicles begin to form on them. Light shines off of them to show its wonder and beauty for all to see in the midst of frigid colds. It still continues to provide shelters for animals that seek refuge inside of that tree. And then it starts its cycle all over again. 
It begins to go back to a time of being watered and thriving and growing. In spring. We see all the things that happen up top. But if you could dig up and see where those roots <clears throat> have gone and traveled, you would see places that it has reached to that you could never have even imagined. There are great blessings above the ground that it gives, but it only comes because of the things that it is connected to underneath. So, Trees have many roots. And St. Paul uses the metaphor to say that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And so the question here for us today is, has one of the roots of our lives become a desire for money and wealth so much so that we love it? Remember, that's just a root, but it leads to all kinds of evil. And you know what, what roots of weeds can do. They, they are some of the toughest roots around, and they go into all places that they shouldn't be going, and they strangle out things that are good and beautiful, and they kill off what's above. So that when people look at them, they think that that tree is not worth keeping anymore, and they cut it down. Maybe one of your desires of your life is not a root of money and wealth, but maybe in the past it was. And now that you have plenty that you've retired on and you're enjoying in comfortability, you may think to yourself, well, this sermon doesn't really apply to me all that much because I'm set, I'm good to go. I don't worry about money and I don't love it that much. I could give it away. You may even quote what St. Paul says in verse Seven, when he says to us this. For we brought nothing into the world, and we could take nothing out of it. <clears throat> Sound like something you've said before? Maybe you can say that on the other side of richness, but beforehand, could you say that? Could you say that you were content with godliness? regardless of how rich or poor you were. And so this sermon still applies to all of us. God wants to speak to both of us today with a different kind of richness because he says through St. Paul, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. The good things of this world, the things that we can see above, are for our enjoyment. Some people think that we should never have anything to do with them, and that's not true. Money is a good gift from God to be used for our enjoyment and the blessing of other people. And a gift that keeps on giving is worth that. That's what we can do with the richness of this world. But spiritually, we need to know where our roots are. See, God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need the beauty of the trees, whether it be in seasons of fall, spring, winter, or even in summer. He doesn't need it, but they give glory, they give majesty, and proclaim God's majesty through the cycles of their life, whether it be surviving in winter or thriving in summer. They give glory to God regardless, because they are content with their lives and where their roots are planted. <clears throat> We don't give tithes and offerings up here because we need to please God and make satisfaction to him so that he might look on our lives and say, wow, look at how much they have and look at how much they gave. No, 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 no. We give to God because 
Others need His good gifts so that they can have roots planted deep. And there are great things that God wants to give us here today. God doesn't need your money. He wants your hope. He wants your hope, your fear, love, and trust in Him above all things so that He can give you everything and you might enjoy the riches that He has to give to you today. And He speaks those riches here today. You can see them in the waters of holy baptism when he started planting roots deep in your life by the faith that was given to you through the power of the Holy Spirit when God said in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and those roots started to grow deep down. Roots that no kind of greed or evil could ever strangle out because that faith clings to the roots of Jesus. And there's all kinds of riches that God wants to give us here today. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 it says, in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 4, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, it says, he made us alive together with Christ Jesus. In Philippians 4 verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to the riches in glory in Christ Jesus. God is rich towards us. Not just in all the things that he's provided for us, such as good government, good family, house, home, clothing, food, all that we need to support our bodies and life, but God is rich towards us. Spiritually, just as I said, when he brought us through the waters of holy baptism and he planted us deeply, but that tree that we have been planted as, as Psalm chapter 1 says, where it says that those who meditate on the law of God day and night are like a tree planted beside still waters. We are certainly that tree only because of the tree that Christ was upon. This tree that was in the world is a tree that represents all the greed of sin that had its roots planted in every single person's life, that consumed every single person's life and showed the need. If you were to expose the ground, you would see every single person's need. Even if it looked like the fruit above was very good, you might taste it, and it would certainly be a bad apple. But this tree... When Christ planted himself upon this tree, his roots grew deep. His roots of grace and mercy took upon those roots which sought to strangle out his own world and he reclaimed it for you. And he gave you rich roots that are planted so deep that are watered through his word that are sprinkled with his blood as he poured out water and blood from his side and every single time we come up here and we have the Lord's Supper his body and his blood are given for you so that you might see how rich you actually are 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 tells us for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich Yet for your sake, he became poor so that through poverty, you might become rich. Everything that God has given you in your life, you can enjoy because godliness with contentment is great gain. And the gain that you have is found through Jesus Christ and what he has done for you. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, keep and guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
Lord to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, you provide us with your holy word that we might know and believe in Christ. Make us diligent to study your word and so grow our roots deeper and dwell in your promises that makes us secure in the ground of your life that we are content with your provision in this life and joyfully look toward the life to come. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, preserve our homes from idols and sins of idleness. Bless fathers and mothers as they teach their children that generations to come might faithfully guard their hearts and rejoice in your gifts. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, even in faithfulness and despite the great comfort we find in your steadfast love, There are many who face afflictions, who are in times of survival. And so let your mercy come, especially to those that we now name, especially for Brianna as she struggles with the healing in her leg, for Greg Randolph as he battles cancer, for every Schreiber and her upcoming surgery, for Dale Holton, cousin of Miriam Bralia, for Maya Murray, granddaughter of Lynn and Darlene Murray as she struggles with her chemo treatments. For Norma Olson, for strength and healing and answers to solve her falling issues. For Jane Close, friend of Larry and Joan Lobitz. For Carol Quartz, sister of Joan Lobitz. For Marcia Offerdahl, friend of Tim Hull. For Wayne Hobbin, continued healing from his back surgery. For Ron Rogers, as he continues to heal from his fall. Let your mercy come to all of them all who are in need of help, that they might find their consolation in your promises until you deliver them from their trouble. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you deliver your people from the sufferings of this world and comfort them with eternal rest. Receive our thanks for your kindness to the saints who have gone before us and preserve us in repentance until we are carried by angels to Abraham's side. Lord, in your mercy. Answer all doubt and fear, O Lord, with confidence in your word and sacraments, that by these means of grace we may be kept in holiness and guarded from temptation and despair until the day when you bring all things to their perfect fulfillment and we are delivered to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated at this time. We bring our offerings forward. If you have any tithes and offerings still with you, there will be offering plates at the back of uh, the sanctuary that you can place those in later. And we join together in singing our offertory. Oh, no. 
stand as you are able. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, the fifth commandment is often associated with doing physical harm to someone, but Martin Luther broadens our perspective of God's fifth commandment, which says, which says these words. You shall not murder. What does this mean for us? We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. This frames our physical relationships with others, certainly, but we want but what we th by what we think and say about others and ourselves. But is this commandment just for those who we like or get along with? No, we should not harm anyone, either by hand or deed. Next, we should not use our tongue to advocate or advise harming anyone. Furthermore, we should neither use nor sanction any means or methods whereby anyone is mistreated. Finally, our heart should harbor no hostility or malice against anyone in a spirit of anger or hatred. Thus you should be blameless in body and soul toward all people, 
but especially towards anyone who wishes or does you evil. And so, let the roots of Christ dwell in you richly, as this blessing of the Lord frames how you go and treat others with the fruit that comes from above. Because we once were enemies with God, but he treated us in love and forgiveness and was rich towards us in kindness. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our closing hymn, Savior again to your dear name. Peace go with you this day. Uh, Just a few announcements. Uh, We have on October 2nd, the Bible study, The Chosen, coming up. I think it's uh, Tuesdays at 6.30, so October 2nd. uh, Mark that on your calendars. It'll be here in the uh, education wing. Um, Oh, it's the 9th. I'm sorry, one week later. Ha, had it wrong. Uh, It's the 9th, and that's a Sunday. (laughs) Uh, So it's Sundays. Uh, at 6.30, though. It's in your bulletin. It's on the, I think it's on the right-hand side of, of your bulletin. Also, October 6th, uh, my wife Danielle and I and Everly are going to have an open house from 3 to 6 p.m. October 6th. You're, you're all welcome to come to that. I know that's still a little ways away. Uh, any other announcements that anyone can think of? Seeing none. Good idea. Seeing none. <laughs> Uh, Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.